birthday, everybody. And happy anniversary. Yeah, having a, a birthday or anniversary, the month of November. Uh, we invite you to participate in the Royal Commission broadcast this morning as we continue to send the good news uh, out in over 90 languages around the world. Isn't that awesome? And so uh, as the announcements are continue to run, have a birthday or anniversary, come on and let's uh, contribute to the world official broadcast.
I did in high school. And they call the row, I say, yo! I probably won't do that in the presence of Jesus. You might. You are smiling. You never know. It depends on if he recognizes me as Steve or Spike. That's true. That's true. This could be.
just finished up my Thanksgiving project. There's one thing left for me to do. That's to stuff it. We've got to stuff our turkeys, right? So I'm going to stuff mine with some of the best stuff that I can find right here. Well, while I'm doing this, I wanted to offer you a challenge. Do you up for it? You know, I don't know if, if Thanksgiving or if being thankful is instinctive or not. I do know that as a child, my parents taught me, they taught me how to be thankful and how to say thank you. You know, when somebody did something nice for me uh, or when I received a gift or, or something like that. In other words, being thankful was taught and learned. And as we come up on Thanksgiving, I want to offer this challenge to you. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, it's found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And I'm going to challenge you to read those three chapters a couple of times through. And what I want you to do is look for ways that the Sermon on the Mount applies to living a life of gratitude. Would, would you do that? Just read through because you know what? Jesus taught us some things about life, some things about living daily that opened the door to a life of gratitude. And it has been proven, and I know you've heard this, uh, gratitude has health benefits, right? You've heard that. It also has spiritual benefits. We're going to talk about that as well. And, and so it's, it's something we should practice. And so I encourage you, read these chapters for me and, and then join us Thursday night for our Bible study. It's at 7 o'clock and we do it by Zoom. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, it's an, it's an online Bible study, and we can actually interact with each other. And I'll be leading the study, and so if, if I don't have your email address, or if you're not receiving these invitations, I need your email address, and I send a, a link to our Zoom meeting every Thursday afternoon. I want to be sure that you receive that, and I want you to join us, all right? It's important, folks, that we learn God's Word and that we live by it and that we grow in it. And so join me, will you? Thursday night at 7 o'clock, and we will talk about living a life of gratitude as Jesus instructed us in His Sermon on the Mount. All right? So I look forward to seeing you Thursday night at 7. Be sure to have your email address. And be sure to read those chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we'll see you Thursday night. Get down to Easter when Jesus died for our sins and gave 
rose again and went into heaven. And, and then, here's one more time, I mean, it, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back again. And so we're excited about that. At least the people who believe in Jesus is excited. It's not going to be all that good of excitement on people that don't believe in him, right? But anyway, um, and, and so it's not something we should be scared of, but you know what? We don't know when he's coming. See, I have his uncle, in, in, his uncle Beauregard, and Beauregard, Uncle Beauregard is a photographer, and he goes around the world taking pictures and stuff, and mostly boats. He takes pictures of boats. There's plenty of boats around here. I don't know why he has to go all over the world. Because I really like the football regard, and, um, but I hardly ever get to see him. But you know what? What? Okay, I just want to make sure y'all can do this. When he does come, you see if he just kind of shows up. And one day I was out playing in the yard. And up on the car, and it was up the low regard. And I was just shouting, uh, so excited to see him. And sometimes he calls, and he says, I'm going to be in the area sometime soon. But that's about all we get. One time, I heard the noises in the kitchen, and I went down, and I thought it was a burger. So I got an umbrella. <laughs> don't know why. But he did, and I went in there, and I saw somebody in the kitchen, and I started swinging that umbrella, and I broke it. But uh, it was Uncle Beauregard. He just showed up. He said, I've been hungry since I got to this evening. So anyway, when he does come, I love it, and I get so excited. So that's what I was thinking about. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but he's coming. And it's going to be exciting for those who live for him. So, everybody, boys and girls, teenagers, everybody, you've got to live for Jesus now. And we can do that because when we ask him in our heart, he gives us the strength and the courage, and he helps us live right, you know, so that we can follow him. So, don't know when he's coming, but he's coming. And I hope you all should be ready, okay? Okay. I wonder if a public guard is coming today. I think I'm going to wait for him. I'm going to keep my eyes open. Bye. 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 Let me tell you a story about two men, both of them riding on an airplane. The first man, the flight attendant, walks up and gives him a parachute and says, This is your parachute. It is for flight enhancement. It will make your flight better. So the man puts on the parachute. It's heavy. It's cumbersome. It causes him to sweat. It's uncomfortable. He starts to look around and he realizes that most of the other passengers aren't wearing their parachutes. Why does he have one on? But about then, the he hits the plane. And he comes to this realization that this parachute is not making his flight any better. And so he quickly takes off the parachute, never to put it on again. But the second man, the second man, the flight attendant approaches, and she says to him, This is your parachute. At some point during this flight, you're going to have to jump out of this plane 25,000 feet. You don't know when, but it's going to happen. The man quickly puts on the parachute. He understands its purpose. Oh, it's heavy on his shoulders. It's cumbersome. It's uncomfortable. It causes him to sweat. He looks around and realizes that most of the passengers are not wearing a parachute. And this concerns him. He thinks they probably need one. But nothing you can say can get him to take off that parachute. Why? Because he understands its purpose. He understands that it is his only hope if he's going to make it. Story it draws us to a better understanding of salvation. I mean, if 
If I were to ask you today, what is the primary purpose of salvation, what would you tell me? Some people say that it is life enhancement, to make life better. The purpose of salvation is to save your soul from the wrath of God. Oh, no misunderstanding. Abundant life, eternal life, peace, joy, all of these things that come with knowing Christ are a byproduct of salvation. But its primary purpose is just to save you. See, we have to understand that God demands righteousness. That's how someone finds eternal life. It's by being righteous. And it is salvation through Jesus Christ that brings about your righteousness. If we understand that, then we understand the purpose of salvation better. See, see, when we have this idea that salvation is about life enhancement, then when we experience turbulence in life, we backslide. We fall. And Jesus likened it to a seed that fell on hard ground. It couldn't grow any roots. And so when troubles came, it died away. And when we realize that salvation is about our righteousness, it, it causes us to want to live a righteous life. And therefore, we turn away from the pleasures of this world and the Bible says will only last for a season. The airplane, the ride, that's life. And the jump, that is our jump from this world to the afterlife. The parachute is our salvation. Without it, we have no hope. But listen, this is something we have to deal with because the truth is, one day, before we realize it, we're all going to have to make the jump.
women, and children. And it's difficult to watch our own nation divided and taking sides in this war. And it's difficult to understand how a piece of land approximately the size of the state of New Jersey has caused so much turmoil over the centuries and over this last month. The Moss, 1987, George W. Bush said of the Moss, that they are cold-blooded killers. A group of Islamic terrorists who literally exist to destroy Israel and all the Jews. This was their charter in 1988, a year after they began. And they want to make Jerusalem the capital, capital of the Palestinians. So what about us? Should, Should we, we take sides? sides? Which side? Why should we even pray for Israel? What's the big deal? Well, first and foremost, the Bible says that we should. In the Psalms we read, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. The Bible tells us to pray. Second, Israel has been our strongest and the most consistent ally over the years. Of all of the others, Israel is at the foremost. But, but, but you know what? It goes much deeper than that. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 7 that Israel is God's chosen people. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, which is treasured possession. Why? Why did God choose? Israel. Will he continue? It did not wrong me. The, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all the other peoples. For you were the, the fewest among the nations. But it was because God loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Why Israel? Because God is sovereign. And that was his decision. That was his choice. Why not Americans? We've been running around. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Well, over these weeks, we have observed Abram taking the road less traveled. The choices that, that, that don't always make sense. The, the, the directions that are not obviously filled with blessing. And in fact, paths that sometimes lead to challenges and dangers and hardships. And what Abram discovered time and time again, what he discovered time and time again, it is that the Lord, our God, is faithful. And that He is the God of possible. God brought sense to what seemed to be ill-advised choices. He brought blessing to obedience. And He brought triumph in the midst of hardships. 
He is the God of the possible. That's what we're going to explore here for the next uh, two, three Sundays. What does it mean? In this series, we'll, we'll continue to follow Abram on his journey to, to the promised land. And since Abram started out on these four occasions in those early stages, God affirmed and reaffirmed his original promise and purpose. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great and will be, you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Are you hearing that in light of today's activity around the world? And so with each affirmation, God revealed a little more detail, including the fact that, that the childless, childless Abram will have a son from his own body who will be his heir. And with Sarah being barren, how is this even possible? And then we come to chapter 16. The 11 years after the promise, and Sarah said, you know what, Abe? Eh? Here's what I think we ought to do. See, See, I have this maid serpent, and I think you ought to take her to yourself. And she, and she will bear you a son. And, and so Abram listened to, to his wife. That's, That's usually a good policy, guys. <laughs> Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Listen to what she said. In fact, later on, it's going to say, at least a couple of times, and Abram listened to his wife. So it's a good policy. However, if, if your wife says, I'm going to bring home a beautiful girl, a woman, and I'm going to give her to you, you just close your ears, all right? Don't, don't listen to that message. But they will listen, and, well, you know the story, uh, as Hagar, uh, what was son, his name was Ishmael. And, and in our human logic, this whole plan makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. Your name's going to be great. 11 years and it's still not happening. So we have the means right here. So let's put it into motion. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Problem is, that wasn't God's plan. And so Hagar, an Egyptian unbeliever, bore a son, Ishmael. And we, we know later that, that, that God uh, also opened Sarai's womb and, and she bore a son whom they called Isaac. So, so we, we have two, two women, one, one man, and two, two sons. The man, man loved both women, and, and the, the women despised each other. Just a little, and, 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 and just briefly recap 
where, where we have, have, how we have followed Abram over these weeks as, as he took the road of his travel. God, God chose Abram. He, he was a pagan. We, we know that uh, he was from Ur, and, and, and according to Joshua 24, uh, his parents were pagans. They, they worshipped other gods. But, but the Lord God recognized Abram and led him from Ur. And he called him out and set him apart and ordained him. He said, leave your father and mother. Go to the land that I will show you. And that land is significant. And in fact, 4,000 years later, it is still in contention. God honored Abraham's obedience of faith and has established a covenant with him and it's recorded in Genesis 15. A covenant with Abraham that, that God established, God created. It can't be broken. There's no way that it can be broken. And the, and the covenant, covenant contained a, a series of, of promises that are recorded in chapter 15. The, the first, first promise was, was the promise of land. A piece, a piece of property we, we now know as the promised land or as Israel. And, and three, three times, times in chapter 15 alone that, that land is mentioned. He's also promised a lineage, a son, the now going to be Isaac, and those people we will know as Jews. And he promised a Lord. That is, in that land and through that people will come the Lord, the Messiah, a prophetic declaration of the coming of Jesus as the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. A land, a lineage of the Lord. That's the covenant. And in that moment, when God spoke the covenant, there began a spiritual war that continues to this day. This war throughout history is just over the land that is who's going to own it, who's going to take it, who's going to possess it. The, the lineage, who, who will be the blessed people, and who is this the Lord? Did you know that the Old Testament speaks of the promised land some 2,000 times? And, and the New Testament speaks of the promised land uh, around 700 times. Land. It's, it's a big, big deal. It's, it's very important. So, so let's recap. Like again, one, one man, man two, two wives, two, two sons, one, one couple. And, and again, it raises these questions. Who gets the land? Who will be the blessed people, and from which side will the Lord come? There was great strife between the two women, as we mentioned, and between the two sons. And ultimately, God revealed His choice that Isaac would receive the blessing, that Israel would be rejected. Look again in uh, chapter 16. So, so she gave this name to the, uh, to the Lord as he spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. I have now seen. This is why the well was called. Here I am, Roy. It's still there when we take it. And so, so Hagar bore 
the Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. As we read on further, we hear this. God said to Abram, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after that, and you, after you for generations to come. Abram fell face down. Because the Lord said, as for your wife, Sarai, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah, and I will bless her, and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations, kings of peoples, that will come from her. Say it back. This is our land. 
land, it's, it's our lineage, and, and we worship our Lord, Allah. Not Jesus. I was watching one of the news clips a couple of days ago about the turmoil on our college university campuses across the country. It is, it is it's sickening and it's heartbreaking. And and I heard, I mean they had they were right in the face of one of the Palestinian supporters, and this is what she said. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. We don't want those two states. We want it all. My first thought was, I hope you're taking grammar courses while you're in college. Because when you say, we don't want no two states, you're not saying what you think you are. But anyway. Here's what you're saying. We don't want to share it. We want it all to ourselves. Folks, that is the Palestinian charter. They don't want to share it. They don't want Israel to have any part of it. They don't want Jesus to even live. And they want Jerusalem to be their capital. 93% of the Arabs are Muslim. But folks, this is deeply, deeply a spiritual Israel is the center of the world where three continents converge geographically. Israel is the center of the world. When we read about north, south, east, and west in Scripture, usually it's talking about from Jerusalem. North of Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem, east and west. Because they consider that the center. It's also the spiritual center of the world. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all trace their roots to, to Jerusalem. It's also the political center of the world. The last battle ever to be fought on this earth will be fought in Israel. It's a big deal. It's this land. The obvious question then is, is this the beginning of the end? When you think about it, I mean, as long as I can remember in my life, Jesus is coming soon, and we are living in the end times, the last days. I've been hearing that for a lot of years, a lot of decades. You have to. And so, you know what? It's really easy for us if we're not careful, to, to say, oh, well, there's another war in Israel. I wonder how long this one's going to last. And, and just kind of flippantly acknowledge that it's happening and go about our business as usual. Probably is we don't know. Israel became a state again, thanks to our president, Truman, who put the pressure on the UN to announce again or to reinstate the state of Israel. In 1967, Israel was attacked by Jordan, Egypt, and Syria, all of them together. Israel was outnumbered, eight to one. You know how long that war lasted? I know. Six days. And in Israel retained possession of the land. I remember it to one. Why? I think because God is in charge. Amen. Well, I know he's in charge. And I believe God's divine protection is on Israel. I heard one one uh, person. I think it's a. I think he 
was a preacher, but uh, really can't remember all the sources in any way. He, he said, said that since 1948, since Israel again became a state, from, from that time until now, Israel has never been the aggressor. And, and though they had been in war and war, uh, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, Israel has not been defeated. They have not been the aggressor. They have not been defeated. So, I wish I could tell you, yes, absolutely. This is it, folks. It's building over there. It's getting hotter by the day. And this is it. So you better get ready. But you know what? I'm not foolish enough to say that. Because people have said that in the past, and they were wrong. But I can tell you this. It's, it's true when I was born, and it's true now. We are in the last days. These are the times, folks. 98.5%, maybe 99% of all prophecy has been fulfilled. So I guess, I guess what I wanted to remind us of this morning is, is, is number one, why Israel is so important to, to us. Remind us of the fact that we should be praying for the peace of Israel. And second, don't give up. We, we thought Y2K okay. was the beginning of the end, remember? Remember when uh, the, the war in uh, uh, back in the back in the late 80s, uh, the Gulf the Gulf War? Thank you, Ray. Uh, you, you may remember our president gave them a deadline of September 15th. And the night of September 15th, my mom called to say goodbye. She said, this is going to be it. And I told you, oh, I love you. It didn't pass. Then we had Y2K, and then we had 9-11. You know what? And now we've got this. So I don't know. In fact, Jesus said, therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So God expects us to stay alert. He expects us to keep watch. And He expects us to keep our heart in tune with Him. And so I want to tell you something, folks. You know, there's a, there's a question... Uh, when I learned one-on-one -on -one evangelism through the James Kennedy, the Wesleyan version of the James Kennedy method, two, two questions that we began with. If Jesus were to come right now and ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? church a lot and, and 
and I, I, I read my Bible as often as I can, and, and I try to be a kind of person. And you know what? None of that is worth a hill of beans if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what gets you into heaven. That's why you're worthy to enter. Not because of what you've done, but because of what He has done. Amen. He loves you, and He has made a way for you to enter the kingdom forever and ever and live eternally in His presence. And have you embraced that? Are you living according to His Word? Are you enjoying everlasting life here and now? Pray for Israel. Stay alert. How are you this morning? Folks online, how about you? Do you know we have a shout out that Jesus is your Savior? And that right now your life with Him is completely up to date. Everything you know to be confessed is confessed. And every relationship on earth you know is intact. It's called the living a righteous and blameless life. Father, this morning, we confess how easy it might be to become anxious about the turmoil in the Middle East. Anxious about the unknown. Maybe it's not that, that we're afraid for Jesus to come back. We're just afraid of what it's going to be, how it's going to be. But the Lord, we thank you at your words this morning. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. God, we claim you today. We claim you as our shield. We claim you, God, as our salvation. And we are living with eyes wide open, believing that it could literally be any moment when the skies split and that our Lord comes in glory. And rules as the sovereign God of all living things. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And, and oh God, that is our confession right now. We humble ourselves before you. And then we worship you. Our soon. Father, for, for those who are praying in the context of this service and in this moment, for, for the assurance of salvation, I pray that you would hear and answer your prayers for the glory of Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys.